Nice. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome again to our uh, course, this third UKID talk today with, with Andrea, Dr. Andrea Bianculli, uh, assistant professor at, the, at eBay, the Institut Barcelona de, de Studies Internacionals here in Barcelona. Uh, she's she's an expert on on our topic today. She's she's doctor on political science uh, here, uh, in the Pompeu Fabra University. Uh, afterwards, she she uh, she joined the Freie Universität in Berlin, and since 2017, uh, Andrea, you will correct me if I'm wrong. She She's uh, she's an associate professor in, in here in Barcelona at eBay. She's uh, assistant professor. Assistant professor. <laughs> assistant <laughs> professor. Uh, she has profoundly worked on our topics. Uh, she's a she's a, a, a good expert on Latin American interregionalism, Mercosur, and others but mainly in Mercosur. She has also written a couple of very interesting things on the European Union and uh, specific issues on the European Union. The, 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 the very last thing she wrote was about the, the, the linguistic policy in the European Union. But apart from, from linguistics, she has, always, she has also worked on, on a wide range of uh, public policies related to this uh, regional integration processes, uh, development, health, and of course, uh, trade. This is, for, for all these reasons actually, we, along with uh, Professor uh, Albert Carreras and Assistant Professor Ramon Schiffre, we, we, we consider her as, as, as an invitable key speaker to, to tackle and to deal with our topic today, the, the EU, Mercosur, Mercosur Association Agreement. Again, Andrea, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and thank you very much for joining us today. So with, uh, with no more delay, because we have plenty of questions to <laughs> ask you, Andrea, we, uh, I, will, I will be bre uh, yeah, uh, breaking the ice with uh, kind of uh, uh, very general questions and then we will open the floor to our the students today. Guys, people remember that uh, you may either use, uh, you may either raise your hand and, and switch your mic and ask your questions out loudly, or if you prefer it, just type them down and I will, I will read them out loudly. Okay, so uh, Andrea, first and very important question. <laughs> Uh, what is Mercosur? How can how can we compare it with the European Union? Because from from our perspective, we, we have we, we we usually tend to to compare Mercosur and the European Union, but I'm sure that there are plenty of differences, but plenty of uh, 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 different things, of course. Yeah, plenty okay. of similarities and different things. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So. Before tackling your question, John Pena, I would like to thank you and the SEUPF for the invitation uh, to this dialogue. And of course, I'd like to uh, thank the audience, right? The students that uh, took the time to join us for this dialogue about European Union and uh, Mercosur. So, um, as you very well said, I mean, um, this book on linguistic policies is one of, of the latest things that came out, but um, in fact, initially, I mean, my PhD was on trade negotiations, right? So um, I mainly analyzed how uh, Chile and Argentina face different um, types of negotiations. So these would include uh, symmetric negotiations in terms of South-South negotiations, asymmetric ones, and here is where the European Union Mercosur negotiations come in, and the multilateral level, right? Uh, and, then, um, and, I, and then I started working more strongly on regionalism and um, on other issues related to regional integration and with a high impact on trade and how these trade processes at the same time had an effect on um, issues like education, health and gender. 
Um, and precisely now I'm starting with a new project on European Union Latin American relations. So it was great this invitation because it sort of helped me to put together to think on these things um, again. So what is Mercosur? So Mercosur is a regional integration project um, that goes back to 1991. Um, so when we talk about regional integration in Latin America, we usually talk about three waves or eras of regional integration. Um, I'm going to use this categorization just to, um, for, for students to situate themselves where we are, uh, though I sometimes think that these ways, uh, this way of dividing into eras or waves uh, it hinders our um, acknowledgement, acknowledgement of similarities across the waves, right? So regionalism has, let's say, pervaded the history of Latin America. There was a first wave in the 1950s, 1960s, just when the European Union, what today is European Union, was being created. Yeah. Um, different regional projects were set up mainly uh, with this idea of constituting a, 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 a larger regional market, right, based on the idea of import substitution industrialization. There were several problems, crises, there was a stalemate in regional integration, and the 1990s, what we see is the emergence of the, uh, what we call the new regionalism or open regionalism. So, to some extent, if you go to the literature, they're going to say that Mercosur is the, the example, right, of uh, this open or uh, new regionalism where the objective was now to insert these countries into international markets. So uh, if we go back in time, so this seems like we we're talking about ages ago, right? So we we're talking about uh, a world that's marked by the end of the Cold War and the uh, strengthening and the deepening of globalization, right? So um, after years of crisis and isolation and, and, and closed economies, Latin American countries decide to bring themselves into the, um, the, the, the international arena. And in that sense, Mercosur was created with this idea, right? Of bringing together um, countries that included uh, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Paraguay, and Uruguay, um, with the idea of establishing a common market. And, um, but it's also relevant to know that, in fact, uh, of course, Mercosur was set up as a new project in 1991, but to a certain extent, there was already an initiative that goes to the mid-1980s, uh, with the first democratic governments of Argentina and Brazil when they established a program of integration and cooperation where the objective was more on uh, promoting sectoral uh, cooperation, uh, a gradual and flexible approach to liberalization with the idea to promote development and also a very a uh, relevant idea of democracy, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and to some extent you can find, I mean, not the gradual approach because uh, Mercosur was um, just to liberalize. Um, uh, I mean, there was no, this gradual approach was completely lost, but of course Mercosur was built uh, based on this idea of uh, trade. The trade agenda was very relevant, but I would say that uh, in Mercosur, other agendas also gained centrality already in the 1990s, as for example, health and education, right? And even in 1996, Mercosur had the first uh, democratic clause. So uh, what's the main difference with the European Union? Um, there is no supranational element, right? So if we are put it in one element, right? Um, Mercosur, but this uh, goes to all regional organizations in Latin America, re remain strictly intergovernmental. So this means that presidents play a very relevant role, right, in the setting up of the processes, in the way in which uh, uh, the regional processes uh, advance, right? What I think is that still Mercosur is quite a relevant case because it's uh, it's been in place for 30 years now, so this is this year Mercosur is celebrating its uh, 30th anniversary, and um, and of course the relationship with the European Union is very relevant because the European Union, uh, through its interregional strategy, this idea of interregionalism has strongly supported the development of regional organisations 
um, but more strongly in Latin America and in Mercosur. And we left something out. <laughs> no, no, very, very, very interesting. Uh, Andrea, thank you very much. Actually, I pick a couple of, couple of ideas you just uh, shared with us because I, I found them uh, really, really interesting. First of all, what is this democratic clause you mentioned? Shall, shall we understand that those Latin American countries in the, in the early 90s were taking advantage of this regional, uh, I mean, the, the setup of this uh, regional process as, as a way to legitimize their uh, their new democracies, their new systems, because unfortunately, if I may, uh, all these countries gone through dictatorships during the 70s and 80s. Right. So what is this democratic clause and how, mm -hmm. how and mo even more important, uh, did this, uh, uh, did Mercosur uh, serve as a, as a mirror for, for other mm -hmm. uh, regional processes yeah. abroad? Okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, very specifically, the, um, these democratic clause, um, these regional democratic clause, to my, uh, my understanding, the first democratic clause that established in a regional organization in Latin America. And this has to do with, uh, um, um, with the fact that there was an attempt of a military coup in Paraguay in 1996. So uh, Argentina and Brazil rapidly uh, responded to this, um, and this led later on to the establishment of this democratic clause, meaning that in order to be a member of Mercosur, um, you have to be a democracy. As you very well said, and if we're thinking of um, what I mentioned before, the uh, the peace, uh, this uh, initial economic and cooperation trade agree uh, agreement with, between Argentina and Brazil, and later on Mercosur, we're talking about countries that were coming out of years of um, dictatorships, uh, which had a, 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 a terrible impact uh, in economic terms, in political, social terms, in terms of human rights violations. So. Um, these countries were attempting to uh, come together and, under a common market, but still the, the idea of democracy um, and supporting democracy was very relevant. Um, and I mean, and it's still relevant today if you think that Venezuela was suspended. So Mercos uh, Venezuela uh, asked uh, to join Mercosur. And in 2006, if I, I mean, sometimes the years, okay. Um, and uh, because Venezuela uh, later on, um, as we all know about the political, social and economic crisis the country has been facing during the, the last years, um, it did not comply not only with all the other, uh, uh, what we call the Acquis Communitaire, as you call it in the European Union, but uh, it was also suspended because of this political situation and because it did not fulfill the, um, the, the democratic clause, right? This requirement for a country to be a full member, right, of uh, Mercosur. I see, I see. A second issue that I, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted you to elaborate a little bit Father, please. Is is this idea of uh, of uh, lack of supranationalism, right? Uh, compared to the European Union, mm -hmm. you you highlighted that the, the four members, I mean the four full members of of Mercosur nowadays, do interact on a on a on a, an inter I mean technically speaking on an mm -hmm. intergovernmental basis, but then. Um, if we if we keep in mind, I mean, we close our eyes and and try to 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 think of the political maps in Latin America and in Europe. In Europe, we have two big engines of integration, which are of course Germany and France, with other big players in the in the game. Italy, of course, the UK until uh, <laughs> December last year. Perhaps Spain and Poland may also have a say in here, but also a smaller countries in time of, of, of demographics, the Netherlands, for instance, which are very important in terms of in, in political, economic, and symbolic terms. But when, then when we look at Mercosur, we only find four members, and mm -hmm. one of them is huge compared mm -hmm. to the others. 
I, I, usually, I, I usually say that Brazil is, is Gulliver mm -hmm. in Lilliput, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. how, how can this intergovernmentalism work? properly when when this interregional process i mean this uh, regional process is composed of four members and one of them is extraordinarily uh more large i mean larger and and more um, powerful than the others mm -hmm. okay. how can this how can this work yeah because okay. all, if we th sorry for interrupting you but no, if no, we no, think no. of uruguay yeah, 3.5 million people, over 3.5 million people, if not, if I am not wrong, they're mm -hmm. even smaller than any of the biggest states in Brazil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, totally. So um, just one comment, because you are the expert here in the EU, but we do know that the EU is not, does not work in, um, in a supranational way for every policy area, right? So what's interesting about the european union is that uh there are areas where policy works or intergovernmentality is the main decision making process there are other areas that are supranational in the case of latin america what you will find is that uh presidents are uh, i mean have the main role right and everything remains strictly intergovernmental and i do agree with you that of course if we think of um and this i mean before this Another note. So the four members, I mean, um, uh, the five members are Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay, and Venezuela, who is suspended. And then we have associate members. So associate members include Bolivia, who has been in a process of accession since 2013, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Guyana, Peru, and Suriname, right? So, um, when it comes to the decision-making process of Mercosur, the, the main organs are, are intergovernmental. So um, decision-making is by consensus. And um, what we find is that associate members do participate in what Mercosur has, which are uh, meetings of ministers for each policy uh, area like health, gender, etc. And but I would say that because of its intergovernmental character, um, this is where uh, you can deal with, uh, or it's a way of compensating for asymmetries, even if uh, because it's one country, one vote, right? Then everything has to be negotiated, right? Politically. And um, but something that Mercosur has tried to do, right, is try to compensate to a certain extent for these asymmetries. And already in 2004, um, the, 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 a fund for structural uh, convert, I mean, structural, uh, structural fund for convergence and development was set up. And this is the FOSEM, which if you hear the word structural, um, what comes to your mind? The European Union Structural Fund. So this has to do with this logic, right? With this idea that uh, for integration to work, uh, benefits has, have to be distributed, right? Um, so for Sam was set up in 2004, and um, I mean, and with all the difficulties, because then again, uh, who's going to pay for this, and who's going to be the main beneficiary of these uh, funds? And uh, and here is where asymmetries play a role, right? So uh, to some extent, it's Brazil who's the main provider, right, of funds for this. Um, and to some extent, the country that's, um, I mean, that's benefiting the most seems to be uh, Paraguay, right? Um, but so far, I mean, there are, I mean, for some has tried to work on different areas um, that include structural convergence, uh, development, social cohesion, um, and also trying to strengthen, right, the structure and the integration process of Mercosur. Um, I would say that still maybe um, we need more policies, right? Coordination among uh, uh, countries in terms of um, of other policies, right? Not just for SEM, but um, yeah, everything has to be negotiated. Yeah, yeah, uh, chunk by chunk, uh, policy mm. by policy. Uh huh. Mm. Uh huh. Good. 
good. I think we're getting a, a, an overall picture on, on how Mercosur works before uh, getting into in, into the association agreement and the and mm -hmm. the free trade agreement that was uh, was at least agreed in principle yeah. uh, in July 2019. But yeah, before before moving on, before uh, focusing uh, on, on the agreement specifically, mm -hmm. uh, from a Andrea, from a historic perspective, how mm -hmm. could we describe, how could we depict the relation between uh, Latin America, Mercosur and its members, and mm -hmm. Europe and its mm -hmm. members, uh, mm -hmm. from a historical perspective, because this is something that will help us to understand, uh, I think, will help us to understand uh, the, the association, the current association agreement. Uh, so, could you please put these relations in a historical perspective. No need to, no need to go back to 1492 when <laughs> Columbus discovered. Uh, yeah, no, 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 I mean, I mean, of course, I, I think to understand what happened in June 2019, um, we need to go back in time to understand how this process started and how it evolved uh, uh, across time, because if we think this has been a negotiation process for 20 years, so 20 years, many, many things changed in Latin America, in the European Union, and at the multilateral level, right? So um, if we think in broader terms, in, uh, when it comes to the relationship between the European Union and Latin America, um, I would say that the agenda, uh, uh, the Latin American agenda gains a relevance within the European Union after the accession of Spain and Portugal. Mm -hmm. So this marked a, a very relevant transition in the way in which what today is the European Union approached Latin America. Uh, but during the 80s, I mean, I would say late 70s, early 80s, um, the, the, the agenda was more focused on political cooperation. Um, when we think of the European Union and Central America, um, these were the years after the, the Civil War, the peace process in Central America. So uh, already then the European Union was pushing for return integration in Central America with the idea that, that this was a way to promote a peace, democracy and development. Um, I would say that the European approach to Latin America changes in the 1990s, in the mid 1990s, I would say that there is a strong agreement in the literature um, regarding the fact that this approach to this new approach or economic interest in the region is very much related to um, to the United States, right? So um, I was mentioning before uh, the emergence of this new regionalism, the 1990s. So we have to think of Latin American countries. Um, not only going through processes of political liberalization, but also economic liberalization, very much marked by what was then the Washington Consensus, right? Um, so Latin American countries would pursue trade liberalization not only unilaterally, but also regionally, as in the case of Mercosur, and um, then at the interregional level and the multilateral level. So, to understand now the relationship within this broader uh, picture, um, to, to, to talk about the European Union Mercosur Agreement, we have to think uh, of this agreement within uh, three elements or arenas, right? Um, so first has to do with uh, the fact that EU Mercosur relies on this interregionalism strategy that uh, the European Union pursued very strongly in the 1990s, right? So, but this is another element that we have to think about is that um, uh, this process of dialogue between uh, regions and region organizations was, uh, was to pursue or to support the European Union's own model of regional integration, right? So this comes with this idea of normative Europe, right? The normative power of Europe. But certainly the European Union was very much interested in diffusing its model of regional governance, right? Um, so 
of course, the strategy um, uh, was directed towards different regions in the world, but I would say that it was particularly strong in the case of Latin America, specifically because there were already uh, different blocks there that came to the uh, go, went back to the 1960s, but some of them were relaunched in the 1980s, 1990s, and new ones were set up, as in the case of Mercosur. But the, I would say that the stellar relationship here is the one that the European Union has to uh, uh, Mercosur. So there was a first interregional um, framework cooperation agreement signed in 1995 that came into force in 1999, and then is when negotiations were launched. But a relevant element here is that these negotiation agreements um, was based on three pillars. And this is a key difference when we compare the European Union strategy towards Latin America um, with the strategy of the, European, of the United States. So the agenda of the European Union always has a trade component, a cooperation component, and a political dialogue component. So these three elements are um, comprised within this interregional process, this interregional um, uh, negotiation between the European Union and uh, Mercosur. Um, from a regional and international perspective, there are two elements. So, as I said before, regionalism was very relevant for Latin American countries in the 1990s to integrate themselves into this new global economy. And secondly, it's the, um, the, the, the signing of NAFTA in 1994. So why NAFTA? Because NAFTA entails a very relevant transformation in terms of the relations, the international and regional relations of Latin America. So it was the first, what we call asymmetric agreement because it brought together developed and industrialized and in developing countries, right? So this was something that was Unconceivable in the 1980s. So uh, this marked uh, a, a very relevant turn in terms of the regional dynamics, right? So um, and later on, what we have is the launch of the Summit of the Americas process, and we did this process, the negotiation of the free trade area of the Americas, that was to create a free trade area from Alaska to Ushuaia in 2005. So in this context, of course, the European Union um, must have thought that there was quite a danger there, right? And at the same time, trade negotiations were going on at the multilateral level. So this was the world of the 1990s, right? Negotiations uh, are being carried out unilaterally, uh, plurilaterally, regionally. So, I mean, there's a whole game of what we can even think nested negotiations, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in this respect, I mean, we cannot understand this agreement and how it evolved without taking into account the multilateral level. Because, of course, the, the, the creation of the WTO in 1994 entails a very re relevant change regarding the trade agenda. We were now talking about the new trade agenda. Liberalization was relevant, but it was not the main topic in this new trade agenda. Everything was now about uh, um, uh, negotiating regulations, norms that, of course, affected domestic governance, right? When we think about services, when we think about intellectual property rights, um, and of course, these issues uh, turn out to be quite complicated at the multilateral level, where you have uh, already industrialized countries like the United States, the European Union, who were pushing for this agenda, and developing countries, right? So um, these issues became very controversial at the multilateral level, where even developing countries could uh, uh, contest these norms because uh, the, the WTO opens a space for building different types of coalitions. So what we see that starting in the 2000s, all these issues, I mean, government uh, procurement, services, uh, international property, um, intellectual property rights, would be moved to the bilateral level, right? As in the case of all the agreements that, repeat, that the United States uh, pushed for after the failure of the FTAA, or um, to the, the interregional level, as it is the case of the European Union uh, uh, Mercosur agreement. Um, so 
So this is the context where negotiations were launched and negotiations went on for about five years, but in 2004, uh, the, the process came to a stall, right? So there was no agreement in terms of the uh, exchange of offers that was made in 2004. And there the process sort of came to uh, a halt. So true, uh, and, the, and uh, quite surprisingly, and as we will see later on, quite surprisingly, this this process uh, get out from the deadlock uh, mm. in 2018, 2019. But uh, while listening to you, Andrea, I was I mm. was thinking. Yeah, I mean, you 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 put it quite clearly that it was a, a it, it was of the interest of both sides, of the interest of the European Union on the one hand and the, on Mercosur on the other. To, to start negotiating and to build this kind of uh, mutual, uh, mutual trust, inter-regional inter trust. But if I put myself in, in the Commission's shoes and I think I want, to, I want to get something from Brazil or I want to get, I mean, I want to expand my, my company's market in Brazil or I want to, 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 to ensure that the, this, uh, the, or, to, or to, to contribute to the political stabilization of the country. I, I'm thinking of Brazil, but I, that's good, that, that could be exactly the same for, for Argentina. Why the European Union preferred to, to negotiate uh, uh, with all the, the Mercosur countries as a single mm -hmm. bloc, mm -hmm. rather than uh, one, I mean, case by case? Wasn't it? I mean, you introduced this idea of a symmetry in the in the NAFTA agreement. First time that uh, mm -hmm. uh, a developing country, Mexico, uh, were were considered were, was invited in the in the uh, at the table of the of the developed countries, right? But uh, I mean, again, why why the European Union was, insisted on this on these bilateral negotiations instead of instead of breaking down with Mercosur and negotiating on the one hand with mm. Brazil and then with Argentina. Couldn't it be much easier for the European Union? Well, but by then, I mean, because later on we'll see that the strategy changed a bit in the case of the European Union, but by then I'm, I'm, I think that the European Union was firmly con uh, convinced that this was a way of uh, promoting its own, its own model of regional governance. So it was the European Union uh, that forced Mercosur, um, and this, I mean, you can, it, my, on the one hand, the European Union forced Mercosur to speak with one voice. So this was something very demanding, very challenging for these countries, uh, because they, I mean, Mercosur countries first had to harmonize their position uh, in the negotiation domestically, then at the regional level. So the four members had to agree on a common position and take that to the negotiating uh, table with the European Union. So this was challenging. This was a, a, a learning process for Mercosur countries. And it also forced Mercosur countries to deal with issues and topics that had so far had not been tackled at the regional level, like it's the case of services, right? Um, but at the same time, I mean, this was certainly challenging, it has its difficulties, it does not mean that Mercosur uh, uh, had a common uh, voice for everything, there were cases in which there were discrepancies, uh, but if you think of what happened later on with the free trade area of the Americas, um, as on the one hand, you had the European Union pushing Mercosur to speak with one voice, and on the other hand, you had the United States, who was, who rather than negotiating with blocs, wanted to negotiate bilaterally. So the United States, within the FTA, pressed, pushed Brazil, Argentina to negotiate on their own. And I would say that this, uh, I mean, this challenge uh, of negotiating together um, to a certain extent uh, led to a learning process for Mercosur, and then Mercosur would oppose uh, uh, the United States strategy, and they would say, we are going to negotiate like a bloc. So then in 2005, as a bloc, they said no to the FTIA. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the same time, there had been 
uh, uh, new governments came in. Right? Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, but that, that, sorry for interrupting you, but that's a, no, that's, no. A, that's a quite relevant point. So one of the main arguments to say no to the free trade area in the Americas was this, insi this insistence by in Washington to negotiate bilaterally mm -hmm. and the resistance right. in Mercosur to speak, I mean, to, 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 to be divided and their, their will to speak with one single voice as they learned in in re, in dealing with the European Union, that's that's quite well, a. Besides, of course, their leverage, their power was much different, right? If they. Yeah. Yeah. So when the I mean, and, and it's very clear because when the collapse, when the, the FTA collapsed, then the the United States just went on signing bilateral agreements with all the countries, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So interesting, so interesting, Andrea. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, if you, uh, guys, is there any question so far? Does anyone, please don't, do not be shy. Um, I do not want to monopolize our interview with, with Andrea. Otherwise I have plenty of questions, so. <laughs> no one yet. Okay, good. And I think it's time now to, to cover a little bit this association agreement, mm -hmm. right? Which actually uh, flooded our media in July 2019. Mm -hmm. It was quite an unexpected. Uh, okay. Before that, I see there is a question. I yeah. uh, don't know if, uh, if it's on the chat. Yeah, how do previous experiences, especially give me the potential? Okay. How the previous experiences of Latin American countries, especially with uh, Inside, investment, yeah. I mean, uh, state support substitution. Yeah, uh, policies limit the potential and success of the Mercosur. Okay, that's a good question, Marce. So thank you for that. So, um, in fact, what I mean, we have to go back in history again <laughs> to understand a bit what was going on. So. Um, at the very beginning, I refer to these sort of three waves of moments of regional cooperation in Latin America. So the first wave was that the, the, the wave of the import substitution industrialization model to create a regional market, to be able to uh, compete internationally, but also with this idea that very much pervaded structuralism, uh, uh, the, the, the CEPAL during the 60s, this idea to reduce dependence on uh, the core countries, right? So there was this idea that what we needed to do was to change uh, the, divi the international division of labor, right? Um, so by then, I mean, during the 1970s, uh, we can say that uh, uh, regional integration in Latin America, um, because of different elements that had to do not only with the political situation in some of the, these countries, but also with the uh, economic crisis that these countries started facing. I mean, the thing here is that when we talk about Latin America, we also have to bear in mind that we are talking about uh, um, sort, sort of a common uh, pattern, but within this, of course, there are very relevant differences across countries, right? Um, so what we know, I mean, what we, but still with, I mean, by the end of the 1970s and the early 1980s, it became quite clear that this uh, model of development uh, was not working uh, uh, properly, right? So this led to, uh, the, um, to the debt crisis in, 19, uh, in 1980, right? And this, to a certain extent, marked the end of this model of development and the implementation I don't know if we can, th I don't think we can think of the Washington Consensus and these policies, liberalization programs, structural programs as development models, um, um, but still this entails a very relevant change, right? From closed economies, protected economies, uh, where the state played a very relevant role to other, to another model where the, the state in fact was to uh, uh, to play no role, right? To liberalize, to regulate, to deregulate, etc. And um, in that sense, some of the 
uh, regional organizations that were set up in the 1960s, as it is, for example, the Andean community, were relaunched and adapted to these new uh, uh, ideas or paradigms. And in the case of Mercosur, um, it was set up very clearly with this liberalization strategy in mind, right? Even if other agendas were part of um, the cooperation um, agenda. Uh, in that sense, um, I'm not too sure what do you mean? Why these previous experiences limit Latin American? Can uh, these previous experiences limit Mercosur? Um, I would say that, uh, and even today, some of them coexist, right? Um, and if you think of the Andean community and Mercosur, for example, all members of the Andean communities are now associate members of Mercosur, and vice versa. So, um, in this idea of bringing together uh, more countries. Um, but we are talking about two different models, right? So some of them were adjusted, some of them did not survive, others survived but were not that relevant. Yes, I, 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 I picked this idea that uh, Latin America can be, can be approached as one single block, as one single mm. pattern, but at the end of the day there are plenty of different uh, differences within, I mean, from Panama to Suaya, right? Uh, the, uh, one thing is Brazil in itself, another thing is uh, Ecuador and its transition uh, in, since uh, the late 90s and a very different, I mean, in historical terms, Chile and, and, and you study Chile quite in a in a in a, an extensive way. Chile is, a, is, is, is always seems an outlier from from the Latin America region, yeah. to, to certain, at least at least on, on their attitudes towards international yeah. trade and their oh, and, and the way and yeah. the way the way they conceive itself that it's they are always looking uh, mm -hmm. overseas instead of looking uh, mm -hmm. to to continental Latin America. At least this is my reading. This is my 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 Western focus uh, perspective. <laughs> Well, I mean, what you find in Chile is that Chile initiated this liberalization process under the dictatorship. Um, when the democratic government came to power, um, of course, there were changes in some of the social policies, etc. But there was an agreement in terms of what was the best strategy um, when it came to international relations, promoting trade agreements, etc. Um, though I would say that the latest mobilizations just before the pandemic would say that maybe Chile is not an outlier. <laughs> yes, I'm not. But... <laughs> no, but no, no, no. But I mean, yeah, it's. Yeah, but uh, for example, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, Chile mm -hmm. signed this P4 agreement with uh, New Zealand, uh, a free trade agreement with three Pacific neighbors. I mean, no, yeah, no, neighbors. No, totally. No, no. And, and, and this is. And this is something which is not as 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 uh, we cannot expect that from Peru or Ecuador or mm. other other Latin American countries that that may also had the have this uh, this vocation this will. Well, but you, I mean, but there are I mean, two things. Um, first, uh, it seems, I mean, now that we're talking about the European Union, Mercosur, it's interesting to remember that in 1999, when negotiations were launched, in fact, the European Union wanted Chile to negotiate with Mercosur. Mm -hmm. But Chile, for Chile, it was pretty clear that the negotiation agreement would take ages with Mercosur because of the different, because of conflicting agendas, because of different interests. And it was Chile that pushed a lot for um, and, and asked the European Union uh, for a separate negotiation, and that's what they got, right? Mm -hmm. So they got the agreement, and uh, they are they have already negotiated, or they are finishing now uh, mm -hmm. an update of that agreement, mm -hmm. right? But at the same time, if you think of Latin America, if we think of the Pacific, we can talk now about the Pacific Alliance. So the Pacific Ooh. Alliance brings all those countries on the Pacific 
and their common um, uh, traits or, 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 or characteristics is that they have all signed a free trade agreement with the, with the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And when it comes to the Indian community, the European Union at a certain point decided to that this block-to-block -block negotiation was no longer working. So they have negotiated bilaterally. Mm -hmm. So this strategy, right, of this interregional or this idea of interregionalism, at a certain point, um, uh, uh, the European Union decided or, or, or opted for another strategy, but not in the case of Mercosur. Mm -hmm. In the case of Mercosur, that's yeah, so interesting. Once again, we have a patchwork of different attitudes on yeah. both sides, and that's that's something I I think we should we should take away from from our talk today. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Let's move back to to the association agreement. I mean, okay. let's uh, let's move uh, back to the transatlantic relations, not the north north Atlantic relations, but north south Atlantic relations. Uh, this association agreement, which uh, was uh, was launched back in in, in 1999, and which took almost yeah, over 20 years to, to be <laughs> concluded, is actually uh, and 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 you describe it quite well. Is it? It's a composite of of, of different of, of different interests and different political goals, right? Mm -hmm. It's not only a, a free trade agreement. It's far more than that. Mm -hmm. We have this uh, this political pillar or this political column, this uh, development pillar, and finally the 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 free trade agreement, the the the, the trade uh, pillar. Uh, were all they discussed at the same time? Did they move? They, did they run in parallel, or or how was it? Because I have the perspective that. For the European Union, it's, much, it's always much easier to, to negotiate in terms of development and to, to, to come into an agreement or to force an agreement in terms of uh, development, but the, 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 the trade aspect is, all, is always like, like the, 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 yeah, the, the, the stone you have on the shoe, in the shoe, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How was it? How, how did those negotiations uh, evolve mm -hmm. throughout time? Okay, so uh, of course you have different agendas. So one is trade, the other one is political dialogue, the other one is cooperation. I would say that each of these agendas involve different actors, right? Um, so as I mentioned before, in 2004, for example, trade negotiations came to a stop. So there were no trade negotiations until 2010, right? When negotiations were relaunched again with Spain, uh, having a very active role in that, of course. Um, but the suspension of these trade negotiations did not mean that the European Union lost its interest in Latin America, in the region, in Mercosur, right? Talking about Mercosur. Because in fact, relations went on through ministerial and technical meetings where the objective was to deepen political dialogue, to deepen cooperation among both regions, and also with the idea that um, to a certain extent, there was still an interest, a mutual interest in, in reopening negotiations at some point in time, right? So it's important that to you know that between 2007 and 2013, the European Union invested 50 million euros to work in areas that had to go with uh, financial cooperation, technical assistance in areas like trade facilitation, education, sanitary harmonization, etc. So uh, there was not, I mean, the, the, the two uh, regions were not fully disengaged because these, of course, uh, uh, went on uh, while negotiations were, uh, were trade negotiations were already, um, I mean, not going on, right? They had been stopped, right? And um, and this was the case until 2010, when trade negotiations were relaunched, right? Interesting. I, you're, and we already covered that, but I think it's it, it's worth it to, to to make a stop on that. You you insisted again on the importance of of a Spain as a, as a, an activator or as a, as a as as a 
uh, yeah, as a key actor in order to to to, to relaunch or to, to give a new mm. uh, movement to, uh, to the negotiations. I may I may guess that it's not only Spain but also Portugal because of the historical relations with with uh, with Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, could we? I mean, it's it's a counterfactual, of course, but <laughs> could we? Could we say that in case that neither Portugal nor Spain joined the Union back in the 80s? I mean, uh, I, I want to I want to to, to put the the, uh, the the focus on on this plurality of actors, uh, plurality of of partners that the European Union has. This uh, the European the European Union in, in its external action. Has has a has a long list of, of partners and potential partners. Uh, can we understand that these different partners are targeted, are, are directed differently, in, depending on who is sitting on the specific offices in Brussels or who is holding the 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 rotatory presidency of the Council? How how I mean I'm trying to understand how the the European Union creates its own uh, single voice. As a mm. as a collection of mm. of national voices, right? What's right. your perspective? At least, what is your perspective? What your thoughts uh, in relation to to Latin mm. America? Yeah. Are Portugal and Spain uh, paramount? Without Portugal and Spain, we do not understand those relations. Or are, are other EU actors that yeah. have their own national uh, interests, their own national agendas in in Mercosur? Right, right. So, I mean, it would be too, I mean, I don't think I can say that there would be no EU uh, uh, Mercosur agreement if it were, I mean, if it, uh, Portugal and Spain had not joined the, joined the European Union, but I do think that they were key actors to understand mm -hmm. this. So, the fact is that Latin America was not on the agenda of what today is the European Union in the 1970s. So, uh, relationship uh, or relations were more strongly with Africa, with other regions, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if, if we look at the history of European Union Latin American relations, of course, uh, these two countries joining the bloc had a relevant impact. You can see a relevant impact of uh, 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 of Spain in 2010. You can see it today when uh, the, the, uh, when Portugal. Is um, holds the, the 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 presidency right, and Portugal uh, and um, the Argentine president had a meeting. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, last week, to to to, to say we are going to push forward uh, the agreement. And I think that that's uh, some elements that we need to take into account. And when we are talking about interest, we are not talking only about cultural historical interest, right? We're talking about Spanish companies having huge investments in Latin America, right? So everything, um, to a certain extent, goes together, right? So, um, but there are other companies, of course, if we think of Germany, Germany is a very relevant investor in Latin America. So, but I do know what I recall from when I was studying EU uh, Mercosur negotiations, the launch of the negotiations, when it comes to the um, negotiation mandate of the Commission, this was quite difficult for the Commission. Because interests within the European Union are very different when it comes to what is the agenda, what are the interests that the European Union is to pursue to push for when negotiating with Mercosur, right? And of course, here you have actors like France who have their own agendas and that may not be um, that happy with the agreement, right? Um, but then, I mean, in that sense, the European Union, uh, the, the Commission has the task to, uh, to formulate this unique mandate, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, because uh, this is some. Of course, this is not. Uh, it's not only about cultural and, and historical links, mm -hmm. but uh, our. I mean, our students have plenty of different courses that <laughs> link 
business con i mean business potentiality with uh, historical connections and cultural this uh, these gravity models in in international trade that uh, help us to understand why the the why spain is closer to argentina than to mongolia for instance and <laughs> i was trying to, to to elaborate a little bit more on that um, let's focus on sensitive issues andrea and where it's almost one hour talk uh if you don't mind we will take a couple of minutes to discuss that this these more sensitive issues that appear at least on the media mm. of course we, we always need to filter what what is published on the front cover of journals here and there and what is uh, what is the reality of, of the trade negotiations but when when this third pillar of the association agreement right the the, the, the free trade area was was presented with I, if i'm not wrong uh, it was it, it was uh, presented in a g20 meeting in japan mm. yeah uh every uh, i mean president juncker and and cecilia malmstrom the the the, the, the former commissioner for trade were we're very happy to, to announce this uh, this free trade agreement, but this is this was one thing the the, the surprise of getting having an, a, an agreement after twenty years. The yeah. second issue was uh, the very sensitive issues that pop up yeah. immediately: agriculture, uh, beef, and other sectors were. Uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish, and not only Spanish producers were were very afraid mm -hmm. of. And then, for me, uh, to to me, the 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 key element, the, the environmental protection. Mm -hmm. How uh, how some uh, some EU actors, France, Finland, have been uh, considering uh, the ratification of the of the free trade agreement because of. Uh, the, the the lack of commitment uh, in the preservation of the rainforest in in, in in the Amazonian and how this talks us about uh, how how trade agreements go far beyond trade mm -hmm. elements. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, mm -hmm. do, could you could you uh, could you agree on? Uh, on the importance of these issues did i did i forget any sensitive issue mm -hmm. and then perhaps the, the most mm, the most relevant question uh, are we linking trade and non trade issues to to in excess or this is the way uh, mm -hmm. trade agreements will evolve and then the the mercosur eu agreement is a, is only a good example of of this new trend, new spot, new pattern, new evolution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, I think that you, you're bringing here some very relevant elements that are going to come up and are going to be in the on the agenda. No, I mean, especially during the ratification process, because uh, yeah, the agreement was signed in June 2019. Uh, why it was signed? I mean, I think that there were this has to do with politics within the European Union, right? The commission that was in place was almost leaving. Um, there was an interest in leaving, I mean, Cecilia Malmstrom, right? So was very interested in leaving office with this agreement signed. To a certain extent, the same situation was going on in Argentina. So by then, in 2009, mm -hmm. Macri was, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we had the Macri administration that was very much interested in pushing for the agreement um, and to a certain extent uh, Demer, right? But then when, when the agreement was signed, it was already Bolsonaro there, but um, there was this, uh, uh, I mean, do domestic and regional politics had changed, right? So this is something that uh, these various elements certainly made for the final move, right? Because in fact, negotiations were relaunched in 2010, but it's in 2017 when they they gained a, a, a full, uh, 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 they were fully activated because of these changes, right? And, um, but now this agreement has to be ratified <laughs> by 27 national parliaments by, and the European Parliament, the Council, 
and the four congresses in Mercosur. This is not going to be easy, right? Um, this is going to be a, a whole negotiation process where we are going to find maybe lots of national logics there, right? And I would say in this respect, what you mentioned in terms of environment, um, I do agree that uh, the environmental agenda is very relevant, right? I am not here uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say that there's nothing like global warming, etc. Climate change. Totally, I'm not going to say anything like that. But I think we have to be very careful, right? In what sense am I saying this? And this is something that has already been discussed, right? So it's totally legitimate to uh, discuss environmental issues. Uh, but we shouldn't take this discussion as what we can say as a way of disguising protectionism, right? Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, having clear regulatory uh, uh, regulations and norms when it comes to uh, environment um, is relevant, but we have to be careful um, where the objective is not to protect the environment, but, but rather to protect particular interests, which is legitimate, right? Every country has its own interests, so that's legitimate. Uh, but then we can think of the EU-Mercosur agreement as a space for uh, developing re a, a regulatory space, right? For promoting regulatory cooperation in this area. And this is not a topic that Latin American countries are not interested in. So, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in Latin America, um, the, the, the Escazú agreement is very relevant when it comes to the environment. And in that case, Latin American countries are facing the, the opposition from Brazil, and even Chile has not signed it. So the mm -hmm. agreement does not only protect the environment, but it brings in uh, norms that have to do with participation, transparency, access to justice. So these are very relevant elements from an environmental and a democratic perspective. So um, we cannot say no, and we can say yes fully. This has to be negotiated, this has to be dealt with, and see which mechanisms, which strategies, um, the, the, this by regional agenda, this by regional space can produce to, to protect the environment, right? I think nobody here would deny the relevance of this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, you yeah. were right in pointing that it's not only, I mean, the ratification will, will turn into a long, long process. 27 plus the European Parliament with the assent mm -hmm. plus the Council and the four uh, national parliaments in Mercosur. So many things. Thank you very much, Andrea. Guys, uh, I think it's time for for op uh, to open the floor to any possible question, any specific issue you'd like, Andrea Bianculli, to, to clarify. Do we have any specific concern, any specific topic you'd like to, to reveal in depth? None? <laughs> it's okay. Maybe it was too much. <laughs> Perhaps it was too much. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. They need, they just need time. So okay. asks. Yeah. I, I lost the, the bubble. So I asked for what main reasons you consider that the negotiations were stopped? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Were stopped in 2004, apart from the, the enlargement process of the same year. Mm -hmm. Were stopped from the perspective of the European Union or of Mercosur? Perhaps both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, pro probably on, on, on from the Latin American perspective, Mercosur perspective. Um, well, in fact, I mean, when uh, the, 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 the negotiations were stopped in 2004 because uh, of differences over the, the, the trade agenda, and this had to, go, to do again with agriculture, with manufactured goods, and with services mainly, right? So 
Okay, okay. So uh, these differences uh, between the blocks uh, made it difficult to come with an agree uh, 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 come to an agreement at that time. Now it would be, I mean, I, I did explore and investigate the negotiation process until 2005. I, I, what I would like to know is because the, 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 the negotiations starting in 2007 and the way they ended in 2009 remained a bit secretive, so still we don't have much information about how it was negotiated. Um, what I do recall from the first phase, the 1999-2004, um, the, the, there was a strong involvement of business, of civil society, even if there were no institutionalized mechanisms for the participation of these actors at the bi-regional level. But, for example, there was the Mercosur European Business Forum, right? So this brought together the largest companies and agricultural interests in um, in uh, Mercosur, but not in the European Union. Uh, so, so there you would have the Sociedad Rural Argentina that was a member of this, but it was quite, um, of course, the interests of this organization were, were, were not the same interests of the largest businesses that were uh, in the um, And uh, so this was, the problem was that there was no agreement on the offer, right? And this had again to do with agriculture, services, and manufactured goods. Um, but the, after the, 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 I mean, what happened? I mean, I very much like to, to know, right? So it's also important that during these years, the 1990s, um, and this is something that to a certain extent changed a lot if we think also of other trade negotiations, right? So if we think of the 1990s, not only the FTAA and the huge mobilizations, but also uh, um, uh, what was going on with, with the WTO, Seattle, Cancun, etc. Uh, there were huge mobilizations and, and people were asking and there was, I mean, in the case of the FTAA, there was a process of uh, uh, incorporation of trying to bring the voices of civil society. And this is something that to a certain extent uh, vanished later on, right? So um, uh, I would say that that happened in the case of uh, uh, Mercosur. And in the case of Mercosur, what happened later on is that in 2003, there was an, a relaunch of Mercosur where the idea or under what was called the Consenso de Buenos Aires, right? Uh, uh, Mercosur was uh, uh, was then to promote stronger social, political, and uh, productive agendas, right? So different changes were introduced in Mercosur. Mercosur would start, would pursue south-south uh, uh, negotiations, right? Uh, but um, negotiations with the European Union or with uh, um, northern countries, let's say industrialized countries, uh, were never uh, publicly um, uh, rejected, right? But for some time, Mercosur would privilege these South-South negotiations, and it's in 2010 when uh, they decide to uh, to relaunch the process. And in the case of the European Union, as you very uh, well say, Sara, this has to do with the enlargement process of uh, the European Union, and the fact that, to my understanding, agricultural interest in the European Union gained more prominence because of the um, of the enlargement process itself, right? Um, and then this was even, um, let's say, a hinder if we think of the, 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 the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. Um, this was a time when the European Union was no longer seen in Latin America and more specifically in South America as the regional model of governance, right? Because the way the European Union had responded to the crisis with austerity policies, um, later on the migration crisis, uh, I mean, at a time when Latin American countries were, were uh, governments in power were more center-left or left-oriented, 
their, their responses to the crisis were uh, much more focused on redistribution, uh, social agendas, etc. So this was a time when the European Union was no longer seen as the motor, right? So this idea of social cohesion um, that the European Union had always promoted um, seemed to be uh, faltering, right, from the perspective of Latin American countries, but more, more, important, I mean, more strongly from uh, South American countries, right? And at the same time, we have to think of the whole of the, the, the whole multilateral process and the WTO, right? So, yeah, these are changes that took place. It seems to me like a, like the perfect storm. Uh, <laughs> Why, but then national conditions plus international conditions plus right a, a, and all these elements aligned uh, opposed each other, right? Right. Uh, the lack yeah. of in, even the lack of capability of the European Union to 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 share a mess. I mean, the the the. Been, you mentioned it. The, the, the European Union has a normative power during the mm -hmm. 80s, 90s, uh, sending a sending a, a, robo a robust message. Look how uh, we we, we 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 move. We set up our regional process here in Europe. Mm -hmm. Take it as a model. In the early in the early 20s, it was no longer the case. The European Union, could, could, I mean, uh, was uh, was was struggling with uh, with uh, sending this message. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, and this we were talking before about why uh, the, the the agreement was signed in two thousand and nine, which appeared to be something out of the blue, right? Out of but then the international agree. context did play a role there, right? Because mm -hmm. it was the crisis of multilateralism, a, a crisis in terms of the, of trade, how the crisis of globalization negatively affected trade. Uh, Trump was in power. Right, so um, this was also a, a moment for the European Union to say we are here standing for this liberal order that seems to be crumbling, right? Mm -hmm. We believe in norms, in international norms, we believe in trade. And also for Mercosur, it was relevant because it sort of gave Mercosur a very relevant place in the international arena, right? So the bloc regained centrality. So sometimes, um, we have to look at these different arenas, right? The national, the regional, the international. Sometimes it's very difficult um, to say, okay, which was the factor explaining all this? And maybe you need to have a look at all these different levels of analysis to, to fully explain what really happened. Fully agree, fully agree. Uh, unfortunately or not, in social sciences, we're, we're always move uh, we're, we're always moving around multi-causality right <laughs> there is no way good is there any final question otherwise we will leave our key speaker uh, okay critical juncture that's good wow <laughs> yeah that's that's yeah it could probably uh yeah, yeah. Probably it can be it can be understood as a critical juncture, even though critical junctures are are quite, I could say, from a methodological point of view, quite uh, complicated to, to to make it to make them evident, right? Mm -hmm. to, to, to to prove them. I mean, to prove the existence of a of a critical juncture. But yeah, this is a concept that uh, that fits in this particular in this particular years. Luis asks. Uh, Andrea, how did the agreement protect European standards, including food safety standards? In particular, how did the agreement protect sensitive EU agriculture products? Mm -hmm. Well, this is a difficult one, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a technical one, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do recall from my previous study that uh, everything that had to do with uh, the protection of geographical denominations, etc., was a very relevant um, issue. I do recall that in this case they have, um, and this is this is something that's very sensitive in the European Union and in Latin America, right, and in South America specifically. It's precisely because of these long cultural and historical 
uh, relations. So uh, to my understanding, but I mean, this is not something that I have explored. Uh, I think you, you may get this information somewhere else, um, that there was a particular uh, norm implemented for this case that had to do with uh, uh, some products using the same name because of being migrants coming to Latin America, right? Um, but I, I think, Luis, I'm afraid I cannot fully answer your question. Yeah, if I, uh, if I remember well, uh, not that long ago, three, four, five months, I mean, with this deadlock, we, we all lost our sense of time. There was a there was a, a ruling in Uruguay because uh, in Uruguay they have been using uh, the name I mean name of European cheese because of the because of the uh, the migration yeah. uh, tradition and due to this uh, new FTA this is this is something to be to be totally abolished. Apart from that, I, th I think, Luis, this is, this is, I mean, it's important to, to recall what we, what we discussed with uh, Mark Jeffrey in our first UK talk in, in, in the sense that the European Commission has, has been uh, holding a very, a very strong position uh, in, in keeping the, 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 the food standards and the safety standards in, in, in all sectors. This is something where the red lines are very very clear and perhaps uh, from a from a discursive perspective a specific st stakeholders use such possibility as a way to critique uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to to establish critiques uh, against uh, the, the agreement but this is something that we, which is not at stake uh, Argentina is, a, is and Brazil but Argentina is a, a, a is a top world producer of, of soya beans, for instance, which some of, uh, some of them mm. uh, grow thanks to, uh, are genetically modified, but uh, this is something which is not at stake, at least uh, to, 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 to my own understanding and, and the way I, uh, I, I see things. Yeah, yeah. Well, this principle I was talking about is the grandfather principle. So to protect, um, I mean, um, to protect products that are already being uh, a part mm -hmm. of the industry in these countries and that have to do with these cultural uh, traditions, right? Yeah. And, and these have been accepted because, I mean, in yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's so many things we use, like queso gruyere. <laughs> yeah, so true. So, so true. that's, I mean, and there are whole industries behind that. But it's not because they copy it, but it's because of migration, right? Mm -hmm. Having European migration. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, do we have any final question for? for Andrea. Otherwise, uh, we all thank you, Andrea, very, very much for, for joining us today and for sharing with, with us this, this very, very interesting uh, perspective on, on South America, Latin America, Mercosur, and the relationship between Mercosur and, and the European Union. We were very, very grateful. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, John Pedro, again for the invitation, and thank you all for being here and for the very interesting questions. Okay, cheers. Okay, have a nice day. See you. you